Welcome to Shades of Us, the show that looks at a person's journey when it comes to race and self-identity. I'm Susan Jun. William Shakespeare once said, all the world's a stage. But how is the visibility of players on the actual stage truly reflective of society? In this episode, we will explore the community of theater and dance and how three people address that perception through the arts. We'll start the show with a playwright. I never really wrote to actually play the roles myself, but I did uh, write plays that had a role that I would be able to play if I wanted to. My name is Corey Thomas, and I'm a playwright, screenwriter. I originally started out as an actress. I wanted to become an actress first because I wanted to be able to move somebody else the way I had been moved. At the age of 12, I went to see a, a play at school. I was living in Switzerland at the time, and it was a play called The Glass Menagerie, which is written by Tennessee Williams. And the play is an autobiographical story that he wrote about his sister who was painfully shy. So this play, I saw it and it just, I, I felt like, my goodness, this is like me. I, I identified with the character that was on stage, the shy girl. I used to, you know, move around from country to country and school to school and it made me feel sort of awkward. Well, first of all, I felt awkward because my family was a little bit weird. Biracial and interracial families wasn't as common back then, or at least not in my school. My parents were of different races, different nationalities, they didn't speak the same language, and it just felt very awkward in those days. You know, when they look at me, I think they think any, I'm anything but what I am. They think I'm like Italian, Greek, Israeli, Spanish. I mean, I've heard so many different, <laughs> different things that people think I am. And I know that, especially when I was younger, I would feel sort of irritated that I would have to tell people or that it mattered, you know, and that I wasn't just seen as a human being, I guess. And I really just marveled that somebody who felt like me was there on stage because seeing myself or seeing someone who I felt was like me had made me feel, I guess, not so alone in the world. It's one of the first plays that I wrote. It's called Pa's Hat, which is coming out of a life experience of mine. Uh, when my dad was 83, he and I went to Liberia. My dad always wore a hat everywhere he went, and in Liberia you call your dad Pa. And it was in the middle of the war. I think it was over 18 years that the war went, so this is now like 20 years later. It was just dark and gloomy, you know, it was not a, a fun atmosphere at all. It was scary, people had gone through a lot at this point. We were on our way to visit the school that my grandparents had built and founded. We were driving towards the school and we passed a marketplace. I said, stop the car, I want to take a picture. And I started snapping the picture and I heard shouting and I didn't think it had anything to do with me and all of a sudden you feel like this kind of sense of something and you turn and there was like a machine gun pointed at my head and a furious young uh, boy because he looked like he was like 13 or 14 furious with me that I had been taking a picture of the skyline and I said I'm not but I thought in that moment I was dead and my father had to give him some money, the boy, and he, he left us. We were just very shaken by that experience. But I knew that when I came back, I, I had to write now, and it gave me a purpose to write. And so that sort of transferred into my writing, which is trying to write people that somebody can maybe sort of identify with or know who that person is. I was able to write someone like myself very multicultural. I usually have a bunch of, uh, of people from all sort of different backgrounds and sometimes different countries, uh, different races, all sorts of uh, people that are put together. Um, and the plays aren't usually about that. They're about other things, but I think it's sort of the way I see the world and the way my family was growing up. One of my plays that I'm known for is When January Feels Like Summer, which has two people from India and then three African-American characters. So they would say, we don't know, is this for African-Americans or is it for Indians? And then one of the Indians happened to be a transgender character. So then for a transgender audience, and I'm like, it's just for human beings. So 
Back in the day, that wasn't such a common thing to see. They didn't quite know what to do with my work because they would even say, we don't know what the target audience is for this play. And that's usually my issue, I think, is that I have a tendency to write this work that's kind of like so many different things that nobody knows where to put it. And sometimes it just gets put nowhere because it doesn't fit into one neat cubby hole where you can have a label, this is a black playwright or this is a white playwright or whatever. And so just because they may have different nationalities or accents or uh, skin tones or whatever it is, um, they're human beings. And I think that that's what an audience will always respond to is a human being, a real person. So I always try to write a person as accurately as possible. I try to research a situation to be as accurate as possible so that um, the details are there as much as I can do. And the audience response to my work is usually very warm. The last three years I've been working at San Quentin Prison. I was originally in there because I was writing a podcast, which ended up not even happening in the end. But there was a man incarcerated for 42 years. We spoke and he was telling me about a program that he has there. And he asked me if I wanted to help him with a play in his program, trying to prevent recidivism. So it's to reach younger men there. And he thought that drama and a play is a good way to get certain messages and information out to them. So I said yes. And it's now three years later, I was struck by the, by the prison. I'd never been in a prison before and I had no incarcerated family member. And I didn't know what to expect when I went there. Um, I know though that I had some sort of preconceived notion of the type of people I would meet there, which was probably based on stereotypes that you see portrayed in the media. And they were nothing like what I had expected. These are intelligent, uh, articulate, intellectual, men who just, except for the fact that they were all wearing, you know, the same blue uniform, um, could have been anyone that you met. And I think I just didn't expect that. Yeah, so this is the, uh, the prison uh, walls. You know, that was important to me. There's a line uh, on the ground that says out of bounds that you can't step over without permission if you're incarcerated. So. Whenever I leave, I'm allowed to step over the line and leave, but uh, the people inside can't do that. The, the set brings back the memories of going to the prison for the first time because, you know, the, it's sort of what you saw, which is just sort of a nondescript room, which is like the media center and the room where I met the men. And so, you know, the set is sort of very simple, but it, reflects the the ambiance there which is not a lot about what you're seeing there really it's more about who who is in there i think i felt so ashamed that i had sort of prejudged the situation and so i immediately knew that i wanted to write about it because i wanted to um, try to educate people so that they didn't make the, have the same um, misconception that I had had. Being one of color, you know, these, these men could be my father or my brother or someone who's related to me. So I just wanted to share and honor them with the world. I've never really considered myself to be an activist or a political writer of any sort, really. Um, because I think I always thought that that meant that it was going to be some sort of agenda-driven work and that it would be preachy. I am trying to break down a wall so that there is understanding of something that is, or someone who might be alien to you. In my own gentle way, I am uh, performing some sort of activism in my own way. Our next guest uses space to find herself through dance. When I dance, what I connect to is the sensation that the movement is supposed to evoke. My name is Liana Kleinman, and I'm a freelance dancer, choreographer, and videographer. It was a hard journey to choose dancing. I grew up in Los Angeles. I don't want to use the word segregated, but there are specific parts of the city that are very dedicated to certain cultural communities, and that creates an incredible sense of cultural pride. 
but it also isolates those communities. My parents shaped my cultural identity a lot. My mom was born in Hong Kong. She moved to the US when she was 11. My dad's parents are from Russia. My grandmother on my mom's side was the only grandparent that I ever met or had a relationship with. All of the other ones had passed away before I was born. So my relationship to the sort of ancestral Chinese cultural side of myself was very strong. My mom was very adamant that we celebrate all of the Chinese holidays, that we know the food, that we know um, our history. That was less my dad's prerogative. I didn't go to Hebrew school. I didn't learn that language. I didn't learn that side of my cultural identity. My mom didn't want us to go to Chinese school. She didn't want us to speak the language because what if we have an accent? Like what if you get made fun of the way that I got made fun of when I moved to the US? I still definitely had part of those traditions. We celebrated Hanukkah, we celebrated Passover. There's this, always this Chinese tinge to our Jewishness. There's a condiment, a Cantonese condiment called yuksung, and we eat that with matzah. There was a lot of those sort of melding of Chinese and Jewish culture that went into my personal upbringing. So throughout high school, I was, I was very math and science oriented. Once I had told people that I was Asian and that I had an Asian mother, I think that that was used a lot of times to justify Oh, that's why you like math. Like, that's why you're the only girl in this honors calculus class. I was also doing dance. My mom's sister went to Juilliard for dance and danced in a couple of shows, but gave it up fairly early on. And there's a little bit of a pathway for me to follow, and I love seeing the dance world through her eyes. I started dancing with a group called California Dance Institute. Let's try this side, crazy hair. Five, six, here you go. Oh, I'm not sure who the winner is yet. Let me try the middle. Five, they come six, to public elementary schools and they like teach you how to do a jazz square. It was really hard for a long time coming from that very academic background to switch to convince myself that other people saw me as a dancer. I ended up at UC Berkeley doing a year uh, studying cellular and molecular biology, but I really wanted to dance and I got really lucky. And there was a ballet studio that was right next to my dorm. So I spent the whole year like waking up early, cleaning studios so that I could take class. And then I ended up transferring to Marymount Manhattan College here in the city. And I got my BFA in dance. I studied Graham. Martha Graham technique. It's about this specific movement that is, you come up and then you just fall directly to the floor and it's, oh my God, it's so dramatic. I think that there are emotions in that that we all feel all the time and we don't physicalize. And I loved performing that. So that was a huge part of my education in dance, the way that I move today. I would say that I am a modern dancer. Dancers today have to train in so many different techniques. We all do contemporary dance. That's a lot of what I do and a lot of what I love. We are all taught how to do ballet. Versatility is as much a skill as specializing in any one thing. I trained really heavily in modern techniques. A lot of what influences your dance you get out of school or the choreographers that you work with. I don't have exact statistics on the racial breakdown in the dance world, but in my experience in the circles that I dance in, it is very heavily white. And there are lots of reasons for that. Might be socioeconomic, might be um, the region of the world that I'm dancing in right now, but there is Definitely a trope of you can be placed in a piece because you look exotic. I've had a lot of people tell me that I should audition for Broadway because racial ambiguity is really in right now. In my experience, it definitely happens that choreographers will cast for specific ethnicities or specific looks. They're not just looking at how well you dance, they're also looking at your image. My last semester at college, I was cast in a work that was a salsa and rumba piece. The choreographer was Latin. We were doing Latin dances. I'm not Latin, but I know that I read that way to a lot of people. It brought up a lot of questions for me about representation 
And when you see a body on stage and you read them as one ethnicity, even if they aren't that ethnicity, is that representation? I think my family's reservations around me being a dancer were the instability that comes along with freelancing and that I had this interest and this passion for something that could provide a really stable career. So it's like looking at two pathways and one is like directly uphill and the other is like this rolling field into a meadow and they're like, go there. And I decided to climb uphill. But I know that both of my parents are very supportive of the life that I've been able to carve out. My mom has flown to New York to see me dance a couple of times. My dad, I don't remember the last time he's seen me dance. I don't think that's a, it's a statement on how much he's uh, supportive or not supportive of my career. I think that my mom's just, a, she wants to be there. She's my mom. Part of the reason that I left Los Angeles was because the dance world out there is very commercial. And that was just an aspect of dance that I wasn't interested in. I think that the dance community in New York has made a lot of space for people who look different, who move different. I feel very comfortable living in Harlem because I get to see a huge diversity of people in my everyday life. Technically we're in Sugar Hill, which is a very specific part of Harlem that I hadn't known about until I lived here. A lot of my friends live in Washington Heights, so it's very convenient, except for there's a giant staircase right up there that you have to walk up every single time. But I think that like when I go to meet my friends and I have to do that, it's like, well, I got my cardio in, so. Um, I don't know, it's a special corner of Harlem. I really love it. I don't think my decision to dance was necessarily predicated upon eschewing that stereotype of Asian scientist, but I do feel like I was in the middle of two identifications. Choosing the identity of being a dancer felt like something that I had agency over, whereas I didn't have agency over being multicultural. We come back to another playwright who expresses her identity through the characters she creates. I'm Leah Nanako Winkler and I'm a playwright. I was born in Japan and raised there. My family moved to Lexington, Kentucky mid-childhood. I think like most people hear like, you move from Japan to Kentucky and they're like, oh my God, that must have been so hard. But actually, uh, Lexington, Kentucky has an amazing Japanese population. It's small, but um, I actually went to Japanese school where my mother taught. And um, since it was my first language, it really helped me kind of assimilate in American culture while still having a really good grasp on my roots. I come from a very, I hesitate to say blue collar because that's such a vast definition, but basically like my dad, like we don't come from like any money. It wasn't rural, but it was kind of an urban atmosphere. I had no arts connections. The theater in Lexington is very hard to break into. <laughs> they take themselves very seriously. There's Actors Theatre of Louisville who does the Humana Festival every year, which is, a, I think, the number one festival for American plays in the entire country. So there is a theater community, it's just not spoken about very much. And how I found it was in high school, I was in a downtrodden path a little bit, searching for identity. In Japanese school, I was like really cool. And in American school, I was like kind of a nerd. Uh, and then I kind of started doing like uh, things that were considered bad. I was sort of falling into like a wrong crowd. And then uh, because I didn't want to go home, after school immediately, I tried out for a play. And that's when my life changed and I really found identity and home in a theater. The first play I was ever involved in was in high school and it was called The Little Shop of Horrors, which is a musical. And I actually auditioned, but I didn't get cast and I was on the crew. And I remember just the feeling of the lights going down in the theater and all the actors like coming out with their weird Ben Nye makeup. <laughs> uh, I, I just got a feeling that I, I was just so calm and I just wanted to stay in the theater forever. It was kind of like finding yourself through different characters and finding yourself through being in different plays. I read a lot of manga 
And this wasn't like a nerdy thing. The part that I most enjoyed about reading manga was the dialogue. And essentially, that was the first inkling I had of telling a story through dialogue. Because if you think about it, the characters in comic books only speak through language. And it's a lot of visual storytelling as well, but I kind of started to get like a rhythm for uh, people conveying their emotions and moving the narrative forward. When I started doing theater, I remember that my teacher, who's this amazing teacher, she gave me a monologue book called The Best Female Playwright Monologues of like 2001. And I started writing my own monologues. I started a theater company when I first moved to New York just because I didn't have a choice. Our mission is to produce engaging theater that honestly depicts our culture by exploring obstacles like racism. <laughs> technological miscommunication and the societal pressures to be rich, beautiful, and well-adjusted. Are you happy now? I was always happy, Katie. <laughs> always. This is all your fault! No, it's your fault! It's your fault! You're such a nasty little bitch you never enjoyed. But I definitely got labeled as somebody who's like, like angry and like fighting for underrepresentation when I was actually just speaking what I know. If I put a biracial woman on stage, they're like, this is about diversity. Around 2015, around that time, I wrote a play called Kentucky, uh, which I started writing at my own sister's wedding. <laughs> it's about a woman named Hero who is sort of the worst version of myself that, that, that I could imagine. Uh, if I had not done theater, uh, a New York transplant who learns that her sister, who had become a born-again Christian, um, is marrying a guy at 22 years old, and she tries to go stop the wedding in Kentucky, and it's sort of a uh, millennial odyssey kind of play where uh, this character goes back to her high school and her friends and her family that she's estranged from. And that is semi-autobiographical in a way that um, is circumstantial, it's, it, it's extremely emotionally truthful, although a lot of the events in the play didn't happen. I obviously did not try to stop my sister's wedding. <laughs> I don't really like set off to write something specific, but I did know that I had never seen a Southern biracial family on stage, and that was extremely interesting to me without it being a race play. I started writing God Said This while I was in the hospital room of my mother's cancer treatments. Anyone who saw that play w would see a universal story. The way that it was reviewed was like, this social justice warrior is trying to challenge like all notions about cancer and race and like what a hot mess of a daughter this is coming back. And I wasn't even surprised, but I was just like, whoa. Even whenever I write like the most non-issue play ever, it becomes an issue play to some people. I had written God Said This uh, in 2017, and that same year, I, I just, much to my surprise, I won the Yale Drama Series Prize, which is a $10,000 award from Yale. After winning that, I was invited to go to the Humana Festival back in Kentucky, and I actually got to, uh, hang out with my high school like teacher at whatever, Humana. Like, he, like, you, like, we know that he has a rotation. We were interviewed by the local paper and I finally broke into Kentucky theater, <laughs> I feel like. So right now, I, I just got off of a simultaneous world premiere of my play Two Mile Hollow, which is actually an issues play. And it's a play where uh, an entirely POC cast pl plays a rich white family. And it's my most popular play and most like well-reviewed re well and well-received play. We're currently in a rehearsal for a reading of my new play, Hot Asian Doctor Husband. Okay. It's true. Hi, Valerie, I'm dying to meet you. I love you. <laughs> I view theater as both an escape and a confrontation. I think it's amazing that theater is still a thing where people are coming into a dark room and not interrupting people doing a play. <laughs> so
So that in itself is amazing to me, but all in all, I just want people to be able to sit in a quiet place and watch the lights go down and get the same feeling that I did when I first saw Little Shop of Horrors. <laughs> That's our show for today. To learn more about the people you just saw, log on to our website at tv.cuny.edu. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time on Shades of Us.